Okay. Uh, all right. So the only thing relevant that I said is that there's many approaches for uh, quantum thermodynamics. And I'll do this analogy with Play-Doh. And please uh, stick with me because it, it, it's going somewhere, okay? So suppose that you want to do what can I do with uh, Play-Doh, right? Everyone knows what? Uh, and, and one approach, which is more or less what Ralph has been doing, is to just play with it and see what you can do and say, oh, from this kind of long cylinder, I can make a snake, uh, sorry, snake, uh, a snail, right? There you go. And from this snake, maybe I can manipulate it and I'll try to make a bird. Can I make a bird? I'll, I'll just make it, right? So this is what Ralph has been showing you, um, which is looking at explicit protocols for, say, transformations, for work extraction, Maxwell's demon, looking at concrete examples and trying to gain bigger insights from this. Another approach, uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, more abstract and pessimistic inclination, is to try to see, well, what are the rules of this game? Try to model this as a game, trying to see what the rules are, and then trying to find like fundamental limits on what we can do or not. And that's a resource theoretical approach, and I will uh, write down things. By the way, my, uh, the lecture notes with what I'll write on the board is also on Moodle, uh, this handwritten ones. Uh, good. So then, what is a resource theory defined by? And as a caveat, there's many, many ways to define a resource series, and you can tweak it a lot. All these definitions are flexible, depending on the setting. People uh, change it a lot. It's just an approach. Okay, so one defines it via a set of states and a set of allowed operations. And the set of states could be anything, and for now we'll use the, the notation rho for states, but later you'll see that it can be more general. It does not need to be quantum state. So, for example, if you want to do a resource theory of Play-Doh, maybe a state is like any figure and is specified by the, by the shape, right, for now. And then you have the set of allowed operations, which are things you can do in here, right? So, um, if I have an operation, it goes from the set of states to the set of states. So, for example, for, for Play-Doh, it could be, well, I can... Uh, manipulate it arbitrarily, anything I can do with human hands, right? You'll see, you have seen other examples, for example, in QIT, you talked about local operations in classical communication, and that's one type of resource theory. We'll, we'll talk about this um, in the next lecture, about that example. So what properties does this have? In most resource theories that we'll see, uh, this thing, this object here is a monoid, which means the following. It just means that it has some identity, meaning that it does nothing, and that it has some operations. So composition, such that you can always compose uh, so if T1 and Oh, sorry, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 belong to T, then E1, E2 also belong to T. But in, in this case, it could be, you know, I can, I can stretch and then I can roll it, for example. Right? I can always compose operations. Uh, and we'll see examples of this. So what do we gain from here? Here later, this could be quantum states, but we'll, we'll see examples. So what we gain from here is that this set of allowed operations imposes some kind of structure on the set of states, right? Because now there are things that you can transform into each other and things that you cannot. And generally, this will look something like this. So let me just tell you. We call it a pre-order on states. None of this pen is good, uh, which is just, we say that rho can go to sigma, we can transform this snake into a bird if there exists an operation in tau such that that takes one to the other. 
So now we have some kind of order, and this is a pre-order, which means uh, the following, it means it's reflexive. So from row, you can always go to row. And why is that? Because you can just apply the identity. And it's transitive. which means that if I can go from rho to sigma and to sigma, from sigma to tau, then I can go from rho to tau, right? And that's, again, if, if this is done by operation uh, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, this is just the composition, right? So the properties of this directly reflect on the properties of the, of the pre-order, and you can add more structure um, more complex resource theories. But for now, we have this, and now what does it look like? Well, in general, it will look something like this. So we have some states. Maybe here's my rho. Maybe we said rho goes to sigma, and sigma goes to tau. But you know, it doesn't need to be totally ordered. So it could also have something like this. Uh, I don't need to keep naming things. It could have, you know, it, it, not all states are comparable. You can have states that you cannot go neither from sigma to sigma prime, nor from sigma prime to sigma. In general, okay? So far, very abstract. So now let's, let's see first, before we go into thermodynamics, because it's still very early, we look at the Play-Doh. And now let's think. Suppose that the resource theory is just arbitrary manipulations, but... I'm not allowed to throw away any plasticine, right? Then, then the kind of structure we get is what? I mean, you can think of it that for a fixed amount of plasticine, of, sorry, Play-Doh, you can always transform it into other things, right? But then if, if I said started with less, I can either go from this set of states to my new set of states, Right? Here I can do also a bunch of transformations, but I cannot go from one to the other. Right? I have something like, like islands. And in this case, what, what we see here that's interesting? Well, all these states are equivalent, meaning that I can go, uh, I can go between them interchangeably. And they are characterized by something. For example, you could think, well, the relevant properties, for example, the mass, of my state that tells me if I can transform the states to one another or not, right? So in this case, it's like rho goes to sigma if and only if mass of rho is the same as mass of sigma. So that's a very boring resource theory. Uh, but now I add one more operation. So now I'm allowed to do manipulations, and I can also throw away uh, Play-Doh. Okay? So I'm not, I'm not allowed to get more for free, but I'm allowed to throw away Play-Doh. So now this adds a bit more structure, right? Because now I can go from sets with more mass to sets with less mass, right? And now suddenly my, pre, my, my pre-order becomes actually, um, it's a total order up to this quotient over equivalent states, meaning all the states are ordered, right? Given some rho and some sigma, either rho goes to sigma or sigma goes to rho. So, uh, another example more real life would be uh, money, right? These are things that cost the same amount of money and you can always throw away money. And these are things that cost a bit less and these are things that cost a bit less and you can uh, trade them for each other. Okay. Good. And now in general, what we want to do when we have such a structure is to try to characterize it. Um, so we want to find something like the second law for this, for this resource theory. So what's the second law of, of Play-Doh is that the mass always decreases, right? If I can go from one state to the other, then the mass can never increase. Think of it like in thermodynamics, you say that the free energy must always decrease. We'll see it's exactly the same, except that in this case, it's a sufficient uh, and necessary condition. So... Uh, 
três, quatro. Ah, two. Ah, yes, there's a few more things I want to say, but let me do this first. So if you look for conditions, for state transformations, these are maybe very generally, it, you may be looking for a function that goes from, takes two states and returns a real number that tells you that, well, if rho can be transformed into sigma by an allowed operation, then uh, maybe this function must be larger than zero. Okay. A special case that's very useful, that most of what we'll look into this, uh, into now, is when it's a monotone, is when g of, of rho and sigma is just some function, a state function. Uh, here's the difference between two things of the state function. And then what we're looking for is something like this. If rho can go to sigma, then f of rho must be larger than f of sigma. Okay, so this would be a necessary condition for state transformation. For example, in thermodynamics, if I can transform a state into the other, we'll see, then the free energy must decrease. Right? It's a witness. Necessary condition would be if the arrow goes the other way, right? Now, as you can imagine, Unless you have this kind of more boring resource theory where all the states are ordered, then the same function cannot be both necessary and sufficient. Right? So an example of a function that's necessary and sufficient would be the mass of the blob of, of Plato. Right? But if you look at an example like this, they cannot be, because their states are incomparable and real numbers are always comparable, Right, then, then what what this does is kind of project your structure into the real line, and if your structure is not totally ordered, then then this will be insufficient to fully characterize the thing. So normally, what we look for is a family of functions such that together they they make a, a sufficient condition. We'll we'll see details of this later. So before we move on to thermal operations, I just wanted to uh, yeah, give just a brief characterization of states there. So let's look at kinds of states, uh, some kinds of states. So we say that Rho and sigma are equivalent if, like we saw, if you can um, transform one to the other and vice versa. We say that a state is a fixed point if it doesn't matter what we do to it, uh, we cannot get out of this state. So an example will be the thermal state. An example in the Play-Doh is the state where we threw away all the Play-Doh and now we have nothing, right? So no matter what allowed operation we apply, we continue having nothing. In thermodynamics, we'll see that um, Yes, that when you have the thermal state, no matter what we do, we continue having a thermal state. Yeah. But then you can have a bit more general notion than this, which is a, not a fixed point, but a fixed set, so an invariant set.
And this means that uh, if tau belongs to this set, then applying the operation uh, will keep you in this set. So one example of there is like you had like this kind of structure. This two, these two things form an invariant set, right? Because you can apply operations that take you from one to the other, but you cannot leave this set. In entanglement theory, you talked about separable states, right? The states that don't have entanglement. So no matter what local operation and classical communication you use, you cannot leave the set of, in, of separable states, but you can move from one to the other. So in a way, they are kind of useless states, right? If, ah, there's one more thing, which is free states, which is not the same, but in many cases it's going to be. So a free state, I'll write it like this, and then I'll discuss. Uh, a free state is that no matter the initial state, you can always build this state. So no matter the initial state in, in LOCC, in, in entanglement theory, you can always build a product state. You can always build a, um, a separable state. So there's like, you see that there's two quantifiers here. And depending on who's defining the resource series, sometimes this order is changed. And the difference is just whether this operation should depend on the initial state or not. And for, for the resource series, we'll see it doesn't matter, but there are some examples where it does matter. I, I, I can talk about this uh, tomorrow. Okay, but the idea is that you can throw away what you have there, no matter what the initial state was, and there's this operation that prepares you the free state. So, the thermal state. Now, yeah. Sorry, the? Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah, this should be ETA. No, this is the operation, this is the initial state. Yeah. Yeah. So, now you can, oh, can prove a little lemma already, which is that the set of free states is an invariant set. Right? So I'll leave this as homework to prove, but you can, you can look at it, right? So these are sets, these are states that you can, you can prepare for free, right? You can definitely go from one to another. Uh, and if you can go from this state to any other state, right, then that state is also free by, by just composing the, the operations. So that's, that's the idea. So therefore, you, you kind of trapped here, right? So, so this is this is the kind of resource series where you can have actually quite a complex structure, but then at the end there's a set of states here that are all interchangeable and that you can always build, right? So in in LOCC this is the case. So all the product states, all the separable states are here, but not all entangled states are interchangeable, at least not in the single shot scenario. Uh, in thermodynamics. In the version we'll see today, we'll see that there's only one free state, which is a, a fixed point. Okay. So now let's talk about thermal operations. And a lot of this should be familiar because you looked, I mean, with Rolf, you motivated uh, a lot of these discussions, so, uh, so a lot of these conditions. Yeah. Uh, I think I have nothing darker. 
Oh, maybe. Does this is this better? Yeah. Okay. So the resource theory of thermal operations is one resource theory for thermodynamics. So just like uh, in the plasticine case, let's see what are we trying to quantify. We're trying to account for kind of all the heat exchanges, energy exchanges, and entropy exchanges. So let's try to um, be very conservative on what we allow. So what are the states? What are the objects of, of my, my theory, the resources? Well, they're going to be pairs of, you know, for every system, I can have the Hamiltonian of the system. And this is the description of the this is density matrix. For most of the rest of the lecture, we'll fix this so we don't have to write the Hamiltonian all the time. And what are the allowed operations? We'll discuss later how to expand the set or not. So one, for now we allow, to all, allow for all unitaries that preserve energy. You saw this already with, with Ralph. And we could leave it at that, but then it would end up being a bit like the, like the Play-Doh without discarding. You'll end up with something like, a bit like that. So now let's allow for something more. So we allow for a fixed environment of temperature T. As you know from arguments of passivity, this is actually the only thing you can give for free that does not uh, totally collapse the, the resource theory. So for example, if you allowed for two bars of different temperature, now you can build a heat engine and you can transform any state into any state. So we do this, we allow for um, thermalizing any subsystem at temperature T, so inverse temperature beta. And one more thing, this is not really a physical operation, but we can always ignore information. So we can all, always look just at a subsystem and this corresponds to tracing out subsystems. So all of this together, what does it look like? Again, this is not a, it's not a physical operation, but for simplicity, it will help us. So this means that all the operations are of this form. If I apply on S, it will be, I take my row S, I plug in the thermal state uh, of some environment at temperature beta. I apply any unitary that uh, commutes with the total Hamiltonian. And then I can trace out any subsystem B of this total, of this total thing. We know what Te beta, this is just the Gibbs state for now. Yep. Uh, good. Also, for simplicity for the rest of the of the lecture today, although this is the more general case, we can uh, always trace out just the environment so that we're always in the same subsystem S, okay? So that we fix the Hamiltonian at the beginning and then we don't worry about it and the states is just a density matrix. So 
So what's the... Uh, as I've told you, the free state in this thing is the is a thermal state. Can you tell me how you'd build it with one such operation? So remember that you you can you can choose your environment to be of any size. And you can choose the unitary to be anything as long as it, it's energy preserving. So one option So now we're talking about system, uh, states of system S. Uh, and one option very easy to do this is to just take your environment to be a copy of the system and take the unitary to just be a subsystem swap. Right? So in practice, in the lab, what this would mean is I, I, I want to thermalize my system. So, sorry. I want to take my system to the Gibbs state, so I just take an identical system, I leave it outside until it thermalizes, and then I swap the two. Good. You'll also see that this is the only fixed state in the tutorial today. All right, so, so this resource theory is actually, it's, it's exactly that kind of example. So it's it's very complex, it has lots of structure, but at the end, all states lead to the thermal state. Good. And I want to talk about a special case because it will be useful for lots of proofs, and that's Something you've also seen with Ralph, although maybe he didn't call it this, it's noisy operations. And what it does is just takes all Hamiltonians are zero or are just the identity. So all Hamiltonians are degenerate. Okay, this is a special case of the set of states allowed. Uh, and in this case, your free state is just the identity. It's just a fully mixed state, right? For all, uh, for all temperatures. This is a much easier resource theory, as we'll see, and uh, yeah, we'll see how proofs work. Okay. So now what we can do is to prove the second law of thermodynamics, and let's see if I can do this in in one hour, or at least we'll get we'll get close to this. So let me just do some disclaimers first. First disclaimer, we only consider discrete systems for now. Second, uh, we'll stay in the same subsystem S, so we don't trace out arbitrary, but just the environment. And third, for now, we're only gonna consider non-degenerate Hamiltonians on S. These three things are easy to generalize. Okay, just that the proofs are simpler in this case, and we don't have so much time, but this generalize easily. The other thing is that, as we'll see, most of our results only work for diagonal states, just like most of the results you saw with Ralph for now. Uh, this is because, of course, it's much easier to prove uh, things for states that are diagonal in the energy eigenbasis, or to say things about what happens to this diagonal. And if you want to talk about coherence, we'll talk about it uh, to, uh, next after the holiday. Yes. It follows from this, right? I mean, this is just, it's the Gibbs state, it's an exponential. So this is dimension of, oh, oh sorry. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, sorry, for any system, yes. Yeah, yeah. So both for S and for the environment, right? Okay. 
So with these disclaimers, and let me just write some notation, then we do the roadmap, and maybe we have the break here. Okay. So, the eyes are the energy eigenstates, and then the populations, well, in general, I'll, I'll look at cases where some state rho goes to some state sigma by thermal operations, and x is just a diagonal uh, of rho, so it's a vector with the diagonal elements of rows, so, uh, so the populations, as you know from Rolf, and y is going to be the same for, right, so this is a vector. Sigma, s. Right. And for the Gibbs state, the vector is called G. Okay. Yes. And now I'll tell you what we will do today, which is a lot, so let's see how much we can cover. So up here are, uh, this is the roadmap. Up here are thermal operations, thermal operations, and down here is noisy operations. First, and I'll give you all these definitions later, so first we'll see that if I can transform one state to the other via thermal operations, then up to some error epsilon. There exists some matrix with some properties, which are right here. That relates the population vectors. Okay. We will see, this is gonna be step number one. Step number two is to now come to noisy operations. So don't worry about this. I'll define what this is in a bit. Okay? So then we see what does this mean in, for noisy operations. It means it's going to be the same thing. And this matrix now is going to be just a double stochastic matrix. Now, as Ralph mentioned a few times in the lecture, if two states can be related via a double stochastic matrix, then this is possible if and only if the, a state majorizes the other. Right, so this is going to be step three. So uh, x majorizes y. I might stop writing all the arrows. Okay, this is double stochastic. All right, so this is something that uh, you saw stated a few times, but we will actually prove it. And then from here it will follow, like you saw uh, by Rolf, that this sure convex into concave functions, functions, are monotons. Examples, entropies. And in the way, we'll talk about something called Lorentz curves. So, so far, so you follow. We do the simplification, we go from the quantum state to, oh, let's just look at what happens at the diagonals and say, oh, they must be related by this kind of matrix. See what it looks like in this simple case. And then 
we relate this to uh, a condition, this majorization condition. And now we know that this pre-order is given by majorization. So then all the functions that are sure convex are monotones, characterize this thing. So this gives us the, the second law for the generate subsystem, which is that the entropy must always increase. Okay? We'll do all these steps, I think. But then we still want to prove it in the more general case, and that's a bit more complicated. So what we'll do is, yeah, we need to do something a bit special, so we do, We're going to find a, a mapping from something that is like thermal operations to something that is like noisy operations. Okay. It will be a bit clunky, but it's something that works. And then we kind of, all the results that we derive for noisy operations are going to um, follow for thermal ones. But I just want to have it written here because later it will be easier to refer to all these steps. So you'll find exactly the same, that if states are related in this way, then the pre-order is uh, something called thermal majorization. And then from here, we'll define uh, And then from here, we'll define kind of the equivalent of sure convex functions, but thermal sure convex functions. Which are monotones. And the examples of this will be the free energy. In fact, the family of free energy functions. Hey. So we'll go from just having the definition of the resource theory to finding the second law of thermodynamics, meaning that if you transform a state to the other, then uh, the free energy must decrease. Okay. So if this mapping is not totally clear, we will come back to it a lot. Yep. Yeah, we'll, I'll tell you this now, yes. It's up to error epsilon which could be arbitrarily small. Okay. If I have six minutes, then I'll just start maybe with the first one. <laughs> because uh, uh, I'll just introduce all the necessary ingredients for this. But if you have questions so far? So what's step number one we want to do is this thing from if Rugo goes to sigma, then up to some epsilon that I'll explain. This thing. So we need some ingredients first. So I know you, you went over this with Ralph, but I just want to repeat it here so you have it more self-contained. So what's a stochastic matrix? It's a kind of matrix that encodes some probabilistic transition, right? So all the elements, zero to one, and all the columns, I think, sum up to one. And then it's doubly stochastic. 
if in addition, this is a sum over i, if the sum over j also sums up to one. And in this case, um, so this together with those conditions, it means that it leaves uh, the identity vector, so this is the vector one, 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 invariant. Of course, later on, what we use is that it, it, it leaves the fully mixed state invariant, right? Good. And now what we call thermal stochastic or Gibbs preserving or Gibbs stochastic or beta stochastic, uh, depending on whom you ask. This is, it's the equivalent of this condition, but for the thermal state. So we just want, when I apply it to the vector with the diagonal elements of the thermal state, it returns me the same thing. Yeah. So it needs to be stochastic and satisfy this condition. The other ingredient that we need, uh, the other ingredient I'll give you after the break, yes. Let's go for a break now and we restart at 35. Is that, that's what you do, right? Yeah. And I'm here if you have questions so far. So if G times the identity is the identity, then I would think that G has to be the identity. Because I can either write it like this, G times identity is identity, or anything times the identity is itself. So uh, permutation, for example. So this is the identity vector. Sorry, this is the identity vector, not the identity transformation. Uh -huh. Sorry, this is the identity vector. Yeah, that, that's why I was like, that's why I was wrote it explicit. One, 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 one. Yeah, this. The identity transformation is a uh, I. Yeah. All right, so it can have permutations, but it doesn't do anything. Yeah. With this notation, there mean like continuous interval from zero to one, or just set zero one. The into the the the, the interval. Okay. Yes, the interval. Yeah. Hi. Um, so about the definition uh, for a free state. This is the same. So this is basically saying that the same map there exists. There exists map epsilon such that it takes every state to the free state, right? Right. Um, and you said that you can, in, in some resource theories, you can swap the two. But I was wondering, isn't that just weaker? I mean, if you have a map that works for every row, then saying that mm -hmm. for every row we have a map is a weaker statement. It's a weaker statement. Yes. Yeah. I can. So I can give you an example. Uh, uh, so suppose that I have a resource theory of coins that are inside the bag, yeah. okay. and the operation is, I tell someone to go and take a number of coins from the bag, yeah. right? Um, you think that maybe the free state is the state where the bag is empty, right? Zero coins. Right. 
But now suppose that the operation is like the person goes and if there's enough coins to take, they take it. And if there's not enough to coins to take, they leave it the same, right? Okay. So in this case, using the other operation, they are free states. So if I have n coins, I use the operation go there and take n coins out, yeah. right? So it depends on the initial stage. Yeah. If, if it's like this, well, maybe my operation can be go take one coin, then go take another coin, then go take another coin until, right, just make it large enough, yeah. like larger than the total number of, of things. Yeah. But now if I make the number of coins going from zero to infinity, or if I make it a real number between zero and one, then, then like if you don't know, yeah, if you don't know the amount you have, you cannot do it, right? So you see, it, it starts muttering when you, in resource theories that where knowledge is important. So basically we have to weaken this. If not that, it's only resource theories with respect to this. We have to weaken this yeah. to make it real. Okay. To, if you want to have something okay, that you call free states, now. yes. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Much bigger? But they, they said this? Yeah. I can't. You see? When you wrote the identity as a vector, you were like, yeah. okay, you told me it's one, so I know it's one. Then you put some subscripts and I was like, oh, I see, yeah. The point here was <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll write bigger. No, but I mean, that's not so important because you said it in words, but I think in general terms, it's not so important. Yeah. They can check the, the lecture notes, I guess. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, okay. More questions or more questions? Uh, no, there, there was a real question. I think it was right here. All right, let's slowly restart. So uh, let me give you one more example, oh, sorry, one more ingredient that we'll need for the proof of that statement that we have not stated yet. Uh, so the error is something you've seen before as well, which are these defacing maps. Oh, maps. So you saw this with Ralph, these are the maps that kill off the, the non-diagonal terms of a matrix, right? So D of row S, it's going to be just the terms, just the diagonal terms, and the, this was a number that was there before, right? Just this inner product. And you also saw with Ralph, I'll take this for granted as an ingredient, 
that for a large enough time you can you can think of it as uh, just kind of not knowing how much time has passed, right? Uh, one over s. H S T ah. O S E This is yeah. Uh, so this is a time that you let pass. How large you have to make it will depend on your initial state. It will depend on the Hamiltonian. Depends on lots of things, but we just say like there's an S large enough that you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. This is the system. Sorry about that. Let's. Yeah. Shall we give it another name? Not tau either. <laughs> Uh, so this is the lowercase s. This is the capital S, but it's small. <laughs> Look, it will not be confusing. It's the only place where it appears is here. Right? This is the system. Uh, no, let's call it delta. Okay. 1 over delta. Delta. Is there? <coughs> okay. So I'll assume that I can take this for granted. And now here comes a lemma uh, that for all thermal operations, you can either deface first and then apply the thermal operation or apply the thermal operation first and then deface. This is the same result. Do you see something like this with Rolf? No? No, OK. So then we have to prove it, and it's a bit uh, long. I'm going to need the other board. OK. It's straightforward. We just need to write the whole thing. So let's do first this one applying the thermal operation and then the dephasing to some state rho s. So first we take rho s, some thermal state of some environment, theta. We apply this unitary, and then we trace out the environment again. And now we get this state and we deface it. So we, got, we apply this thing. T. Now look that this state now is only on S, so E minus I H on S T H bar E I H S T H bar. If you cannot read uh, the lecture notes of this, the next part's gonna get a bit messy. So the first thing I can do is to just take the partial trace outside this whole thing. So I can do one over delta partial trace of zero to delta dt. And I put here the identity on E, and out comes the rest. U OS tensor. So this is all inside the partial trace. And what I can do inside the partial trace is arbitrary unitaries on the system that I'm tracing. Right? Does not change the reduced state. Okay, so of identity on S.
is the same as taking the partial trace directly. <laughs> so what I'll do here is to apply here and here the following unitary, and I do it because it will make things work out later. So the unitary I'll apply is going to be identity on S times the time evolution, so U, V, uh, uh, for the same amount of time. I think I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, I can do this, and I can even do mixtures of this. So I do this here, I do mixtures of this, and then it comes inside, which means I can put it here. H E T over H bar E H E T over H bar. And now I can use the fact that the unitary commutes with the total Hamiltonian, right? So it also commutes with the exponential of the total Hamiltonian. I skip the step that I can do mixtures and I can just bring this thing in but I'll type it nicely, right? So you know that you know that U commutes with the total Hamiltonian, so it also commutes with E to minus uh, HS because this is just the exponential of the total Hamiltonian. Yes? So, now I have trace over E, one over delta, this integral, dt, the U that acts on S and E. And now what do I have here? I'll have E, Rho S E to I H S T over H bar tensor the time evolved version of the thermal state. But what's the evolution of the thermal state? U dagger, sorry. Now, the next step is just to look here and say, look, the thermal state is already diagonal in the energy eigenbasis, so it does not evolve in time. The time evolution of the thermal state is just the thermal state, so this is going to be Te of delta, right? And the other thing I can do is now, the only thing that depends on T after I do this is this part here, so I can put the integral again inside. If I may raise here. So then I get trace over E of what? U as E. And now comes one over delta. This thing. times the, tens the thermal state. U dagger. But now this thing here is just a dephasing map, right? This is just a dephasing map applied on rho S. So the whole thing is just First applying the defacing my own row S and then applying my thermal operation.
Yeah. Let me know if you have questions. Yeah. So it came from trace E of whatever state is here is the same as trace E of um, identity times some U T of E. U T of E, right? And because it is the same, I can also then look at convex combinations, which is what happens when I go to inside the um, inside the integral. Or, or no, I, do, I don't even do this. I, you can like take the integral outside the trace, put the u of t inside, and then uh, yeah. All right. Good. So now you believe this lemma. And as a corollary of this lemma, I call it lemma one. The corollary of this is that, well, if I can go from rho to sigma, this means, I mean, that there exists a thermal operation that takes me from one to the other. This now means that the diffase values of sigma is the diffase values of, it's like applying the diffasing after applying the E to rho, and this is the same as doing it the other way around. So this is the same as doing E of the diffasing of rho. Why do we want this? Because these are our vectors, right? This is my vector y, and this is my vector x. Except here, they are still in matrix form, but the only non-zero elements are this. So now we use it to prove the theorem. Seven. Theorem two is the following. So if there's two steps, so this is direction this way. So if rho if rho can go to sigma via thermal operation, meaning that sigma is epsilon of rho, then there exists a special, uh, what did I call it, thermostochastic? Yeah, Gibbs stochastic, thermostochastic, thermostochastic matrix such that uh, y, so if I look just at the diagonals, then they must do like this. Okay. And in fact, the theorem also tells me that the matrix is given by, so the element ij of the matrix. So this is the matrix I'm looking for, if you cannot read. And then I want to look at the element ij. And this is given by the following. We'll prove it. So E This is one part of the theorem. This is the part we'll prove. This is the part that we will not prove now, which is the other direction. And that that is the following. For every epsilon, 
So look, this is a MATCAL E. It's a capital E. It's a MAP. This is an epsilon. I could also make it. Uh, let's make it a delta. Why not? It's not the same delta as before. But just so you know, for every delta larger than zero, if there is a Gibbs stochastic matrix, oh, thermal stochastic matrix. Such that, uh, such that, that thing holds. Then, then we can build an allowed operation, a thermal operation such that uh, that kind of implements the stochastic transformation. And the way we measure this, so up, up to this error delta, the way we measure this is going to be at a maximum over all indices of the matrix I want, the matrix I have, ij minus the matrix I build, going to be smaller than this delta. Uh, this T should be. Let me just write again what this means. So, if I have an allowed quantum operation that transforms rho to sigma, then the diagonals must be related via uh, a Gibbs stochastic matrix, which in the elements of this matrix is given by this. We'll see how to derive this. And second, if. Um, if there is a Gibbs stochastic matrix relating two vectors, then we can build an allowed operation such that the, if we take now this quantum operation and we'll build the corresponding matrix, then they are very close to each other. We can always approximate it by a thermal operation. So we prove the first part. The reason why I make you uh, suffer through this proof is because this 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 um, this kind of techniques are actually very common. It's like I have a complex setting. I try to reduce it to something as simple as possible. In this case, uh, stochastic matrices. Good. So proof. Okay. So first, we start from this thing we proved before, from this lemma, and call. Corollary. And this again, what is this? This is just sum over i, xi. Ah. So this is just the vector x and y, but in matrix form. And now if I want to write again the from my vector, if I want to look at component j, well, that's just by definition this. And by definition, it doesn't, by definition of the, of this matrix, or, and of this inner product, it doesn't matter if I deface the octagonal elements first or not, because I just care about the diagonal element. And now I just replace it with that. So now I have J. And now I have my thermal operation applied to the phase original state. J again. And now I can take this sum outside. Let me do it here. So I take the sum outside. This is a sum over xi of j 
Epsilon. Right, I. Oops. J, right? But this is exactly. We exchange the y and j, but it's exactly this definition, right? So this is my matrix element, g. I j. So this means that y j theta mu x i. Right. From here to here is just the definition of matrix multiplication, right? We're looking at the yj. It's given by that. Took, and here I might have swapped the i's and the j's, so you can have, can try to work it out. Now, we showed that indeed uh, the diagonals are related by this kind of matrix. We still need to show that it's thermostochastic, but that's that's direct. So because the uh, the original OK, I'll not write it down. It's in lecture notes. But because the original map is trace preserving and completely positive, then this matrix is going to be stochastic. And because it preserves the Gibbs state, right? if you have the Gibbs state here, you'll end up with the Gibbs state there. So it's going to be um, uh, it's thermostochastic directly. Yep. So to prove the other direction, what one does, so with this, we prove this direction. To prove the other direction, what one does is to uh, actually build from this operation to find an environment large enough and then build an explicit thermal operation to do it. And because we don't yet have a lot of experience with thermal operations, I, I prefer to leave this for later or as, an, or as an exercise, but not this week. But it's just like this delta here comes from how large an environment I take, a thermal environment I take, in order to implement this thing. The larger it is, the smaller I can make this, uh, this delta. But so. With this, we finished the first step of the proof. Now, what time is it? We have 20 minutes. Good. So the second step comes for free, right? So now, uh, you know, for noisy operations, oh, let me bring it here. <coughs> we prove this. So for noisy operations, it's the same, but because now the, the thermal state in noisy operations is the fully mixed state, this matrix must preserve the fully mixed state, which means it's double stochastic, right? I just apply this thing precisely to the special case of noisy operations. Remember, it just means the Hamiltonian is degenerate. All thermal states are fully mixed. Right? So then preserving the thermal state means preserving uh, the identity the fully mixed state, which means it's double stochastic. Good. So now we need to prove this thing here. And maybe we have time to prove this. And then we leave this mapping for tomorrow. I don't know how much of it Nuria needs. OK. So remember, we're doing all this work just so that we can find some monotons, so we can find kind of some laws for this resource theory. Uh, yeah, OK, I can prove it. So we want to show this, that g uh, well, for a double stochastic matrix means that x majorizes y. And the ingredients are again I know you talked about majorization, I just want to write it down here. So x y It means essentially that x is more peaked, more peak distribution than y, right? So I 
first they sum up to the same value, which is one because it's probability distributions, and for all cup smaller than n, if you sum the first k values of one, it's going to be larger than. Where these vectors, I don't know if it's the same notation that Rolf used, it just means I, I take my vector elements and I just rearrange them in descending order. Okay. So I don't know if you saw this in QIT. Did you talk about Lorentz curves? Maturization? No? Okay. So we introduce them now. So this is a way to kind of visualize immediately if a state maturizes the other or not and they become more important in the thermal case. So what we do is to uh, kind of draw some curves. So let's call it L Lorentz of some vector is the set of points where this is going to be the horizontal coordinate and this is going to be The vertical coordinate. So <coughs> it starts in zero, okay, and it starts in zero. Uh, let me give you an example. So suppose that x already ordered down is this vector 0 0.8, 0 0.2, 0, 0. How do you draw it here? Well, Okay. One, one, two, three, four. You just look here. Okay, what's the first one? Is zero point eight. This is one, two, three, four, because there's four values here. The second one is now 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2. So there's sum of these two. So it's going to be here. And now for the third one, it's here in position k equals 3, right? This is k. And the sum of the three first values, and here's the sum of the of the other three values. Different example. So this was x. So suppose that y. And I giving them already ordered. Uh, one over four, one over four. Like the uniform distribution. So one, two, this is 2.5 here. Then the sum of the first two here. Then somewhere here. Tuck. And then somewhere, it should be a straight line. Right? So this is L of Y. And that's L of X. Right. Why is this useful? Because then the, the condition is X majorizes Y if the curve of X is always above the curve of Y. And they end at the same point. Right? They must end in one. Okay, so in this case, you can see, so uh, L of X, I'll write above it formally, it's like not below L of Y is the same as saying that x matrices y, just by definition of how we built these things. So in this case, x matrices y, which means we can go from state x to state y. Uh, maybe I can give you an example where neither matrices each other. 
So if x is, for example, 2 thirds, 1 6, 1 6, and y is 1 half, 1 half, 0, then in this case, it was going to look like took, and then very slow, and then very slow. This is x. And y is going to look like uh, 2 thirds is smaller than this. Sorry. Chuck, chuck, chuck. Yeah, it's a horizontal line. Yeah. So in this case, you can see that neither the green curve is above the red nor the other way around. So what this corresponds in your resource theory is going to be this kind of examples of two states that you, you cannot convert to each other in any way. Okay. Uh, why am I telling this? Some people find it very useful to draw the Lorentz curves to see immediately if a state majorizes another. Um, and in the case of thermal majorization that we'll see later, it's kind of defined by this. Okay. So now I want to prove that theorem finally. That's the last thing we'll do today. And the proof is very nice, it's by induction. Mm. So this is the proof of that statement three there. So we do it by in induction. And without loss of generalization, assume that all the vectors are already ordered, because it can always permit the order. This is a valid uh, operation. So first we prove for dimension equals two, meaning so x is just x1, x2. And y is just y1, y2. And we say that this, by assumption, it majorizes each other, right? We're going to prove that direction first. So if it majorizes, there's a double stochastic matrix. So in this case, well, what do we know? Well, x1 must be larger than y1, for sure. And that's larger than x2. Because, you know, if they are ordered, then this must be larger than 1 half. And this must be smaller than 1 half, and the same here. So then what's on top is always larger than what's on at the bottom, y2. And we know that they sum up to the same value. So then from here, we can build directly the, the transformation. So how do I build the y1? I know it's, large, it's smaller than x1 and larger than x2. So it's, it's a convex combination of these two, which means that there exists some t in this interval between 0 and 1, such that y1 is just a little bit of x1, the larger number and a little bit of the smaller number, right? So it's a sandwich between the two. And then using that plus this condition and some elementary uh, arithmetics, you can find that y2 is given like this. Yeah. And this tells us what? It tells us that the matrix now is uh, this matrix, t, 1 minus t, 1 minus t, t, right? If I do t, g applied to that vector, I'll obtain the other vector. 
all the rows sum up to one and all the columns sum up to one, so it's doubly stochastic. Yes? Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Thanks. There's also a typo on the on the handwritten note, so watch out. Okay. Right, so this case is easy. Uh, how much time do I want to spend? In the next case. So it's a proof by induction, so we assume it's true for some dimension d, and we want to prove it for dimension d plus 1. Right. So, or in fact, assume that for d minus 1 it holds, and then let's see how it works for d. I tried to make this nice, so let's write the vector x. x1, there's going to be some special xk here, xd, and this is larger than the y, which is y1, yk, yd, not n. Okay. So we choose the k that is the smallest k. So Choose k, which is the minimum overall possible case, such that y1 is larger than xk. Okay. So y1 is smaller than everything up to here. Okay. Up to here, but it's larger than xk. Good. And now, uh, what we'll do is to just create a matrix that acts non-trivially only on this element. Okay. So that we can kind of apply the results from dimension two to this case. And I think I'll just sketch it and then the rest of the proof is there. Okay. So create, define G1, a matrix, such that G1, X1 is exactly the same thing as before, right? So y is between this and this, so we want it to be y, y1. So it's going to be t x1 plus 1 minus t xk. That's going to be your y1. And that, uh, sorry, g1 applied to xk. It's going to be 1 minus t x1 plus t X, K. Okay. So the matrix looks like this. So it has a T here, then it's got a bunch of ones, and then it gets to position K, it has again a T, ones. So it's the identity except for these positions. Here it has one minus T, and here it has one minus T. Okay. All the rows and all the columns sum up to one, so it's doubly stochastic. This is what G, G1 looks like. And then, well, now we're going to see what happens when we apply this matrix to our initial vector. So when I have G1, let's call this vector Z. And it's going to be well, here we have y1, then everything else stays the same, x2, x3, da da da. And then when it comes to the position k, we have this thing here, right? 1 minus t xk, or x1 plus t xk. And then xk plus 1, do 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 do. XD. So it's just one small step that gets us a little bit closer to, to Y, right? We got the first value already there. 
So what is left to prove, I think I will not prove it today, but you, you can see it in electron notes and you can, you can do it at home, is that, well, this matrix, if, sorry, Z modularizes Y. So this you can prove, so you can see that for these values it's trivial, then here you do a bit of calculation and see that it also matterizes Y. So it, we went, somehow we, we went from G, applying this G1 to some state Z, which has the first element, then we apply, we'll apply some RG2, do, 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 do. We'll keep applying this double stochastic matrix that only acts non-trivially in, in two elements until we get to Y. Okay, uh, now, I will not show this, and the reason why this works by induction hypothesis is that from now on, we can, because the first element is done, we can forget about the first element and work just with this vector, that is dimension d, d minus one, and try to get to the corresponding version in, in y by applying the next thing. Not the cleanest explanation, but if you look in the notes, it's clear there, I think. Yes. <laughs> I tried. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, here. So we have that y1 uh, is between x1 and xk, so we choose t, oh, okay. we choose the t that, that gives us exactly this, right? And then the only problem is that we're left with some rubbish here in this position, right? This rubbish. And then what, what's left of the proof is proving that this, this rubbish is not problematic. Even with the rubbish there, the, the first vector still majorizes the, the final vector that we're trying to get to. Okay. So this is a matrix. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, what did I write here? Yes. So yes. Yeah. So think of x one. Yes. It's an abuse of notation. What I mean is that the matrix is of this form. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Something like this up to swapping the i's and the j's. That's what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Look, what I mean is that we build this matrix such that when we apply it to x, you return with this. So if you look just at the first element, it's that. Sorry. No, you're right. This is, this is very messy way to write it. Okay, so if I finish now, super quickly, uh, back to our diagram. We are done for noisy operations. So, because now we have that the, that the priori is given by majorization, and the definition of true convex functions are, uh, is just, if a state majorizes the other, then this function is decreasing or increasing, depending if it's convex or concave. And as Ralph told you, the entropy is an example of such a thing. So from here, we derive that if, if all systems are degenerate, then the second law of thermodynamics in this case is that the entropy must always increase. Okay. Now, what's missing is, is doing this for non-degenerate systems. Okay, we'll do this uh, tomorrow. I think you will use the definition of the better sure convex functions in the tutorial, but you can use it independently and then I'll prove that we'll get there. Okay. Good. Now, before I let you go, I just want to tell you that, I mean, this is just one special case of one resource theory. That turns out to be very useful because we can, we can find many, uh, many limits for what is possible or not. But one can always 
uh, complicate things. And we'll s I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but uh, for the tutorial, one example that you work with is now, if with Play-Doh, now you, you're allowed for different colors, right? So now you don't have just one monotone, that's the mass, because you can mix colors. And now this becomes uh, very messy and becomes uh, much less reversible as a resource theory. So your job will be to try to create a resource theory for Play-Doh with many colors. Uh, good, I'm off. You can have lunch, and Nuri will see you at the tutorial. And I see you tomorrow. <laughs>